Galen, did you get a haircut? Oh my god, are you accusing me of breaking the law, Claire? I would never. <laughs> well, well, Galen, your your self done haircut is really, really good. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. Public opinion on the Black Lives Matter movement and racism in America more broadly has moved dramatically over the past three weeks. In fact, support for Black Lives Matter grew as much in two weeks as it did during the entire past two years. So today we're going to take stock of the various ways public opinion has shifted and look at how politicians are responding. Also, as businesses reopen and protesters continue to gather around the country, we'll ask whether we're seeing a second wave of the coronavirus and what the political implications could be. And here with me to do that, our editor-in-chief, Nate Silver. Hey, Nate. Uh, Hey, everybody. Also here with us is senior politics writer Claire Malone. Hey, Claire. Hey, Galen. And senior politics writer Perry Bacon Jr. Hey, Perry. Hey, Galen. So we are going to get to everything that I just mentioned. But first, by popular demand, we're going to ask one of our favorite questions, which is good use of polling or bad use of polling. So listeners may have already heard about this, but I'll just run through it in case you haven't. CNN published a poll last Monday showing former Vice President Biden leading President Trump by 14 percentage points nationally. Trump's re-election campaign then wrote to CNN asking for the network to retract and apologize for the poll. They wrote the poll is, quote, designed to mislead American voters through biased questionnaire and skewed sampling. And they went on to say, quote, it's a stunt and a phony poll to cause voter suppression, stifle momentum and enthusiasm for the president and present a false view generally of the actual support across America for the president, end quote. So as far as their accusation of skewing goes, they take issue with the fact that only 25% of the poll's respondents were Republicans. So, uh, Nate, let's start with you. Is this a good use of polling or a bad use of polling by the Trump re-election campaign? Well, it's a it's both a bad use of polling and a bad faith argument. I mean, we kind of debated how much to engage with this at 538 because, like, we generally don't believe in responding to bullshit with arguments that operate on the pretense that like it's not bullshit um but look uh people this kind of goes back to unskewing in 2012 where the theory is that okay every party should have a certain fixed set of party identifications so x percent of the electorate is republican x percent is independent x percent is democrat right um there are a couple of issues with that one of which is that can change over time. If you're feeling frustrated with the Republican response to coronavirus, for example, or the protest, then maybe you say, now I'm actually an independent. So it's one of the things you're trying to survey people about is what their political identity is. That's one issue. Um, second issue is there's a lot of kind of apples to oranges comparisons. Um, some polls will say, okay, you have to pick either Democrat, Republican, or Independent. Some polls will allow you to say other. Some polls will ask what your lean identity is, by the way, um, what your registration is, what your identity is are two different things, right? You could be a registered Republican who identifies as a Democrat um, or a registered Republican who um, identifies as Independent but always votes Democratic and things like that, right? So there are different apples to oranges comparisons that people are making. Um, you know, so it's just not really the kind of argument that I think um, – people who know polling that much take seriously. Um, it is true that 14 points is a big lead. And if 14 points is a big lead, then bigger lead than other polls show. Um, we have our polling averages coming out um, this week, actually, spoiler alert. Um, and that shows, on average, Biden with an eight-point lead, right? So showing Biden up 14, that's a big lead, for sure. Yeah. Um, but if you so- publish tons of polls per week, you're going to get some some outliers, and usually there isn't need to, like, ask for a apology or allege a conspiracy. Yeah. So Perry and Claire, I'm curious what you thought about how the Trump reelection campaign went about this, right? Cause it's not just a use of polling. They're asking for an apology from CNN and for them to like actually retract the poll. I, I mean, that's asking for an apology is just, it's just a way to elicit in, in, future media appearances or White House press briefings, you know, the idea that CNN has still not apologized for this poll, 
blah, blah, blah. We all know this by now that the Trump campaign is using in part um, voter animus in the Republican base towards the media as a strategy to to kind of get people angry about everything. Um, anger is a great motivator in elections. Um, we should be very honest about that. So it's just it's a, it's a rhetorical ploy. Um, you know, I think I think Nate kind of dissembled the actual sub- substance of it. So I guess I would say two things. I guess the first is this is. I'm a little more concerned about this than just being a, I think this is like normatively bad in a certain way. He sued, uh, Trump has sued uh, news organizations organizations when they've um, wrote stories that are negative about him. The idea he's, they should retract the poll, not just to criticize it. There's definitely an authoritarian element in how he handles these press disputes that I think is problematic and abnormal compared to Jeb Bush or George Bush or Mitt Romney or or John McCain or Barack Obama or Joe Biden. Um, The second point is though, I do, worry that when you have an outlier poll like this, there is some social science evidence that people tend to tweak those more. They tend to read those more. They, they get more attention than they otherwise would have gotten. I'm looking at our polling average. I mean, I'm looking at the polls of the general election that have been done. Biden plus 10. There is a Biden plus 14. Biden 11. Biden 9. Biden 13. Biden 11. Biden 8. Etc. So, I do. I saw some of the tweets the CNN reporters sent out, and they were very emphasizing the the fourteen and not saying this is kind of outlierish. And I do worry that every news organization has an incentive to hype their own poll, but yeah. I don't think that is good for necessarily for the audience who is necess- not necessarily told fourteen. Like I don't think Donald Trump's going to lose by fourteen. I don't think it would have lost by fourteen last week either. And I do worry that we don't do as a media a great job of saying this is a poll, this is big news and it's buzzy because it shows him down 14, but we're not really sure that's the most accurate portrayal of the electorate right now. Right. There's a, there's not a lot of yeah. literate sto- like writing around polls, which is basically like, don't write a story based around a single poll. But if your news organization is putting out the poll, you probably get props from the boss when you tweet out the poll with like the sirens. Um and by the way, Perry, you know, to go back to your your point about it being a deeper issue, like a, a this authoritarian instinct, I do think that's right. And like, as we saw some of this stuff about like the media is lying or like they're lying to you about the actual support behind Trump. I mean, a lot of this stuff more darkly plays into the idea that Trump, you know, the, the thing that Trump was doing before the 2016 election, which was sowing doubt about the results, the, the future results of the election, right? He was basically laying the base for... You know, the, they're not counting your vo- votes. They're purposely obscuring things. And so it, it does play into the conspiratorial instincts of a, a, a certain number of people in the country. I mean, I'm not sure it's even smart tactically. Um, you know, one thing the Trump campaign, I think, kind of did a good job of in 2016 is because, like, they didn't really trust the mainstream media anyway. They actually didn't get in a lot of these disputes. Mm-hmm about polling and sending out their memos that most campaigns can't seem to resist, right? I think almost never makes campaigns actually look good. Um, often forces the campaigns and turtle pollsters to take a public stand when they should be giving honest advice to their candidates. Um, it's also not clear like, okay, if one candidate has a big lead, there are competing theories. One theory says that would create a bandwagon effect, so therefore, oh, I see Biden ahead of him for Biden. The other one's just the opposite and says, okay, well, um, makes you complacent. And so um, the Biden voters don't turn out. I think the empirical evidence on which effect prevails is really ambiguous and not very persuasive in either direction. Um, but it's not very clear that the Trump campaign wouldn't be better off saying the media treats us as a huge underdog and we'll show them on on November 3rd, right? Um, that was kind of more their attitude in 2016 and that seemed to work fairly well. And so, I don't know. I don't know if it's just like, um, I mean, Claire, maybe you're right that like, um, you can imagine a world in which Biden wins um, and Trump is alleging fraud or something, shenanigans. And people say, well, Biden won and he won. It was aligned with the polls and the polls are therefore more robust evidence that kind of this is how people really felt and there wasn't anything untoward that went on. So they have to discredit the polls too, right? I'm not sure if it's that elaborate. I mean, I think one of the disincentives for anyone kind of in Trump's orbit is that Trump apparently through a lot of reporting um, gets very annoyed when you kind of give him bad polling results, right? So it could be people trying to curry favor 
with Trump, right? You create fear with Trump and you kind of bash CNN, right? Um, you kind of are killing two birds with one stone in that way. But I think you're not actually helping Trump. And in general, the fact that like, um, in general, I think polling people for campaigns should not have a public profile, right? Should not be engaged in any type of interpretation or spin. There are lots of Democratic campaigns that screw that up also, right? Um, but with Trump in particular, kind of spinning to the candidate and to the public, and like that can get you down eddies that I think are often um, not very constructive if you actually want Donald Trump to be reelected. All right, so I think we can say that this is a bad use of polling and perhaps not a good faith argument and, you know, give those stamps uh, for both. I guess sometimes you can have uh, a good faith argument, but just not do the polling analysis particularly well. Um, so let's move on and talk about recent shifts in public opinion on racism. I mentioned at the top of the show that support for Black Lives Matter had increased in two weeks, the past two weeks, the same amount that had increased in the previous two years. So beyond that, big shift. There's a whole bunch of other polling that's going on that's illuminating how Americans are thinking about this. So Perry, how would you describe Americans' view currently with the reckoning with police violence and, and racism? And how big of a shift is it? So I think there's a big shift going on uh, with everyone in terms of how they view the police and how the police treat black people specifically. So most people of all parties think that what happened to George Floyd was terrible and they disagree with it. They want the officers fired. And beyond that, what you're seeing in the polls is a plurality, if not a majority of Republicans and a lot of polls are saying that there's a broader problem with how the police conduct themselves regarding black people and maybe there, there is some kind of of racial discriminatory issue in terms of policing. So you're seeing that's among Republicans and then among, and then those views are already shared by most uh, most black people and, and those numbers have gotten from like 80 to like 90s. They were already shared by most Democrats, but those numbers are again getting very high and pretty close. So, so all Democrats, meaning like white and Latino Democrats now increasingly agree with black Democrats and all those people see sort of an overwhelming evidence of police bias against black people. Now, so that's on policing. You saw these universal changes. Now, in terms of when you ask other kinds of questions, then you get more division. When you ask kind of questions about how much racism there is in America kind of more broadly, you find the you find there's a big partisan gap where Republicans generally say that there's not nearly as much discrimination in other sectors of life outside of policing, while Democrats say there is a lot. And the Democratic numbers are pretty unified but across races, and the Republican numbers are pretty unified as well in that they are sort of they see less discrimination broadly. And the third thing I would say, when you get to question, there's a lot of questions we can get to later, but there's a lot of division among questions when we get to like taking down Confederate monuments, or you get to um, defunding the police. So that when you get to specific, specific policies, um, then I think that unif the unity breaks down even among Democrats on some level. Yeah. I mean, when we look at polling on all kinds of cultural issues more broadly, uh, Nate and Claire, how notable is the shift um, for support of Black Lives Matter and just people saying that there is racism in how the police conduct themselves towards black people? I mean, it's a pretty notable shift. Um, it's pretty unusual to have uh, public opinion change on a dime that much. Um, there are some comparisons to, uh, to views on gun violence um, after Parkland, for example. So if you're an American um, that thinks a shift is welcome, then that would be a cautionary tale. Um, that something happens, people kind of um, are persuaded, but then kind of things fade after a couple of months. Um, I think one thing that Perry said is actually maybe important, though, which is like, in some ways, it's easier for underlying opinion to shift if there's not like kind of necessarily like a particular policy proposal on the table. Although there is talk about defunding the police and there's talk about what defunding the police actually means. Um, but the fact that like people can broadly agree with the sentiment that, um, you know, Black Lives Matter uh is something they understand now what that means and they understand how that can be empowering and an idea they support right and they understand that um you know that there are huge problems 
in policing toward minority communities and maybe policing in general. Um, the shift is also, in addition to being um, fairly sweeping, is also fairly broad-based, right? You really kind of see this among, there's a shift among almost every ethnic group and almost every party. So no, this is not, this is not normal. Of course, it's not normal times. You know, we've had a very strange few months as a country, and maybe that kind of maybe makes people more willing to like reset their priors a bit and re-examine things. Um, the last thing I'd add for context too is like, Trump is not very popular. Um, and so taking a stance against racism and a lot of Americans see President Trump as being racist, um, if you ask them. So taking a stand against racism can also be a way to kind of say, you know what, um, President Trump, or at least certain parts of President Trump are things that I do not stand behind. Yeah, the whole idea that I think Perry um, talked about this when he was running through the numbers, but the idea of defunding the police and, and sort of more specific policy ideas, that's where you really start to get into people kind of being like, oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm sort of thinking of defund the police as like the new abolish ICE, which is that it's rhetorically too strong for a lot of Americans, but it's it's the product of activists who are kind of trying to pithily say like, this is this is like our policy platform in one phrase. Um, but, you know, you're, you're going to see a lot of politicians who, you know, a lot of their job is to kind of complicate those things and to make proposals more palatable to more people. So it's inevitably going to water things down. Um, but I think that the the like the turning tide against police broadly is sort of interesting. And, um, you know, we talked about this a little with Sam, I guess, two weeks ago when we were, you know, looking at um citizen deaths at the hand of hands of police in America. And it was interesting to for from the data to note that um, citizen deaths in the hands of police, and I'm being purposely because that can encompass both like shootings, but also like Freddie Gray, right in the van, right, where you don't really know what happened. Um, those have gone down in big cities, but have gone up in suburban and rural areas. Um, and they've got they've gone up for you know white people in those areas too. So there is this kind of broad I think American displeasure with the police. Um, obviously, there are huge racial elements to all of this, but I think a lot of Americans just don't like cops. Um, I think there's like no other way to put it besides that. So, um, but but recognize the need for a lot of people in the country to feel like there's someone policing society so it's we get into this kind of really sticky thing of like maybe not sticky you just have to have conversations then that are like well what do you maybe we should move away from defund the police and be specific about what we're actually talking about yeah perry what does the polling look like when we get to the specifics of defund the police so let me look at some numbers there was a great uh list of questions about these policing ideas done by the huffington post with um ariel edwards levy and so i think they did some asked some great questions so uh do you support defunding the police 27 percent support 57 percent oppose so that's not popular um banning police officers from using chokeholds 70 percent oppose who are those people 73 percent support a federal registry for complaints against police officers, 17% oppose, 72% support. Developing a national standard for when officers can use force, 69% support, 19% oppose. Limiting the transfer of military equipment to police departments, 46 support, 36 oppose. And then budgeting less money for your local police department and more for social services. For instance, funding social workers and mental health professionals. You have 44, for, 44 support, 41 one oppose so, so like, that's kind of a narrow issue so the com but the conversation then of like it, i'm about to say something which is annoying but it's like i wish the conversation were more nuanced because like if we're if we're just going to have a national debate about should we defund the police i mean sometimes those are the conversations that just want to make you like scream because it's like we're, we're talking about semantics and not actual things which as perry just reeled off americans have thoughts on <laughs> like specific policies. I mean, yeah. how, how um, centered are the discussions on, I don't know. I mean, we're all in our own bubbles, I guess, right? To me, it feels like 
there are people saying defund the police and meaning a variety of different things by it, and the Trump campaign is pushing this. I don't know that the average American necessarily sees the protest as that being their goal. <laughs> um, people, by and large, seem pretty sympathetic with the protests. Um, and so I'm not sure if that narrative is uh, breaking through or not. Yeah, I mean, this kind of seems like Obamacare almost, where you pull specific provisions and you find support, but the branding is just bad um, or just doesn't get support. What do we know about how those issues break down? Like, is defund the police enough of a uh, uh, kind of agitating idea that Trump can use it to his advantage? Or are people more focused on all of the things that Perry mentioned that the majority of Americans support? I mean, it's worth noting, this is obvious, but worth noting, Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi are not talking about defunding the police. So what the Democrats say and what the activists say are entirely different conversations right now. Like there's a Democratic bill that they're writing in Congress, and that bill is about banning chokeholds and adding registries. And it's full of, and it has like five of these things I listed where two thirds of people support. So Joe Biden was asked about it. He said, defund the police. He said, no, immediately. So I do think that that's a different, so the Trump campaign challenge will be on some level to graft onto Joe Biden views he actually does not hold. He might do that, but I think it's a sort of a challenging thing. I do think in the in the cities and the states where like and the most policing is written in the city at the city level, not the state or federal level, I do think you're seeing some amount of like, if not quite defunding, there have been some cities that have already said we're not going to increase funding. We're going to change our funding formula. We're going to get police officers out of our schools. So that's going to be defunding of sorts. So I actually don't think defunding, you know, I hate this. I'm weary of the Overton window concept, and I think it can be overdone and silly at times. But I do think in this particular instance that the defunding conversation has created some debate about what is policing supposed to be like in America. And I do think that people's views are evolving on some of those the questions. Yeah, what I was going to say is like, the Trump campaign is not I mean, Joe Biden is going to come out and start talking about this stuff on the campaign, and he'll develop something probably along the lines of we need we need a national ban on chokehold we need a national ban on you know one other policy and it'll become part of his stump and he'll use it i think probably as a way to say wow i thought i was a a person a white person who was crusading for reform i didn't know anything and it allows biden to be part of the mainstream of american public opinion but also from a Machiavellian point of view, it allows Biden to have a little bit of a rehab of his image, which was basically like, hey, this guy was the architect of the the crime bill, which put a lot of uh, black men in prison. So it does also offer Biden, crassly, a political redemption story if he, if he swings it from defund the police to a conversation around the police in America are out of control. Joe Biden has these specific plans to curb them. That are reasonable, that sound reasonable to the moderates, you know, who who are alienated by Trump's rhetoric. So he himself, you're saying he himself is trying to identify as one of those white voters who over the past three weeks has said, like, I'm starting to realize or like has changed their opinion and started to say that racism is more prevalent in America than I previously realized. I mean, basically, it's it's. Actually, not basically. Let me read you a quote from Joe Biden in a Politico story. I thought we had made enormous progress. We finally elected an African-American president, he told voters in a live streamed Young Americans town hall last week. I thought you could defeat hate. You could kill hate. But the point is you can't. And then days earlier, Biden said he thinks others are experiencing a similar awakening to their own willful naivete. Ordinary folks who don't think of themselves having a prejudice bone in their body, don't think of themselves as racist, have kind of had their mask pulled off. Guys, like this is the guy who a couple of weeks ago got in trouble with Charlemagne the God because he was like, you ain't black if you're not voting for me over Trump. I mean, it's almost this, it's almost as if from the heavens, he was given this gift of like, you can kind of get a mulligan on your (laughs) really kind of on the lines, like racial talk about race that's really clumsy to a lot of younger voters, particularly younger black voters. And you can kind of say like, yes, I am part of the, you know, 
the contingent of white people that is awakened and I didn't know I was like completely in the dark about all this stuff. I think it's it's kind of this this uh, again this is crass but it's like a it's like a pretty big saving grace for Biden in some way. Um and I and it's and it happened really quickly and he's had like a really awkward year long struggle with certain voters in the Democratic Party to prove to them that he's like the right person for this time when a lot of Americans are kind of awakened to the the racism that has been in the political system for a really long time because Trump kind of makes subtext text. I mean, Trump's first rally is in Tulsa on Juneteenth, which is the site of, you know, this infamous killing of Black people, right? Like, like it's pretty... Or well, they postponed it by a day it now, but yes, yeah, originally so, it was scheduled right. for Juneteenth, yeah. I mean, sorry, th- this is just a sidebar, but I posted this in our Slack channel. I gasped when I saw that. I mean, that's like pretty strong symbolism. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, the question of whether Trump could... The question of, like, whether a Republican president could exploit this and the question of whether Trump will successfully exploit hmm. this are two different questions That's because Trump's has very little credibility around issues related to race relations. It's like the worst issue. Um, when you ask how does Trump handle this issue, it's his worst issue and has been even before George Floyd. Um, his obviously political strategy is often very, very clumsy. I mean, the difference is like Biden, I think, can kind of, almost pull off, oh, here's this older, average-ish kind of guy who who can be a little clumsy around things, right? And isn't perfectly politically correct, but like, but has a good heart, blah, blah, blah. You know, I think people like, I think he can kind of pull that off, whereas like Trump, they just don't really trust Trump on issues related to race for, I think, lots of pretty valid reasons. And it's like, it's like, um, it's very hard for him to have any strategy apart from like, just hoping that other issues become more, more salient. I mean, he might even prefer um, COVID to this. I don't know. We're going to talk about COVID in a bit. Actually, I'm not sure about that. The combination of COVID and a discussion about race in America um, around police violence and largely peaceful protest at this point is like kind of the worst possible combination of issues for, for Trump. Yeah, I mean, as Trump has said that, for example, he doesn't want the names of military bases changed from honoring, you know, Confederate generals, etc., even though the military seemed open to it. We've also seen from even people like Mitch McConnell being like, you know, this is a time that we need to pay attention to what these protesters are saying. Is the Republican Party writ large more in line with Trump's vision of don't take down the statues, don't rename things. And I don't know what Mitch McConnell's position on those things is, but like, or is it more like, yeah, this is a moment that we should rethink some of these things, Perry. So, um, you know, there's a Republican effort in, in the Congress right now to, um, to figure out, to find some kind of bill that they can write this kind of a policing reform bill. It would, I think it is, they are discussing like banning chokeholds, for instance, themselves. Tim Scott is heavily involved in writing that bill. So I do think Republicans are fully aware there's a new discussion happening here in Kentucky. Republicans supported an effort that happened over the weekend to remove the Jefferson Davis statue from the state capitol. Um, in Kentucky. So I think there, the Republicans also see this as a moment. Uh, there was a vote on Capitol Hill to uh, change the names of some of some bases that have the names of Confederate generals on them right now. And so some Republicans voted for that. So I do think it's a space. And also Trump himself has said what happened with George Floyd itself was terrible. So I do think this is not necessarily a totally partisan issue. I think Republicans are trying to find new footing here, trying to signal that they don't like what happened with, with some of the police either. They're, they're open to changes on some of these racial issues as well. So I do think they're trying to find their footing. And in some ways, the Republicans on the Hill are doing a better job, I think, than Trump. Wait, but I mean, Trump said, yes, what happened to George Floyd was bad and his family should see justice, etc. But on lots of other things, he's more pushed back against some of the things that Republicans have been fine with, like, you know, maybe changing the names of military bases yes. and so on. Like, is this... Uh, you know, 
I ask this a lot, and maybe this is just a dumb question at this point. Is there a strategy behind this, or is this just like a closely held belief? He's responsive to certain... I think he's more responsive to certain elements of what he thinks of as his base. You would go to Trump rallies and you go to Trump rallies and there's a, there is a contingent of police officers. Like that's a pretty strong thing. The military Trump does see his base as kind of being like the, <laughs> the law keepers, right? The law, because he is the law and order candidate. He's, he is for people who keep our society in order, literally. Um, the Confederate statue stuff is like, to me, a pretty, like, I don't think Trump has a super deep understanding of the roots of the Southern strategy, but I think he has picked up on the conventional wisdom of the Republican party for the past few decades that sort of says there's a base in the South that you should keep happy. And so he knows that for a lot of those people, there's, there are strong feelings about, Confederate history. Um, and he kind of instinctually has reactions to those things. I mean, Trump has picked up a lot of, I think, the conventional wisdom of the party as it's developed over the past few decades without thinking all that much about the potential electoral ramifications in 2020, i.e. at a time when a lot of Americans seem to have a problem with his overt racism and the racism of certain elements of society, i.e. the police. And therefore, he is alienating electorally perhaps more people then he is exciting in his base. Um, I think the more that this gets into issues that are kind of um, on the periphery of the story and not about um, police violence and racism in the protest, then the more likely it is that people who are not extreme partisans will tune out and therefore you get the kind of more typical partisan response, right? Like, you know, Confederate statues um, seems like something which um, probably the average person who saw the George Floyd video and is seeing the protests won't have a strong opinion about as the police violence themselves, right? Um, or itself. So, you know, I mean, that's one way that kind of stories eventually work their way out of the news cycle as eventually people have expressed their opinions or talked about things and reporters have covered stories from different angles and it kind of spins off into next day controversies and next next day controversies and then those kind of become less impactful. To back you up there actually Nate looking at the HuffPost's polling with Ariel Edwards Levy as Perry mentioned earlier they asked about opposition to removing confederate statues and in 2017, 49% of people were opposed. And in June 2020, 49% of people were opposed. So like, actually, nothing has changed on the issue of removing Confederate statues, even as we've seen some of these big shifts elsewhere. And when it comes to the Confederate flag, in 2017, 47% disapprove. In June 2020, 51% disapprove. So only even four points of a shift on the Confederate flag. I guess I want to kind of wrap things up here. We've been talking about this maybe uh, in general, but to ask directly, like, how do all of these changes in opinion affect the 2020 general election? Like, does this all fade? Like, and you mentioned maybe this is possible earlier, Nate. Do these changes revert back to the mean by November? Or is this like a real reckoning moment that's durable for four and a half months? Um... I, I don't know. I mean, the, the prior is probably yeah. that there is some degree of mean reversion. Um, if you do look at something like um, gun violence, but it is also kind of, okay, here, because I think actually, frankly, like, um, your priors are important, right? You know, one story I tell myself um, about gay marriage, for example, is, hey, actually, this is a case where there kind of is a right side of the argument. <laughs> and so over time... Wait, Nate, um, you think gay should be right allowed side, to get married? I think I'm going to disclose a political opinion. I think gay people should be allowed to get married. Uh, should they be allowed I to not that, get fired from their jobs for being gay? Yes, I think that. And I also think that police have ginormous problems with racism, right? And I think it's good that, like, you know, that we're shining more Ooh. of a light on that. Just um, laying it all out, Nate. Laying it all out there, right? But, like, but I mean, I think there might be some debates where, like, um, 
just kind of one side actually kind of has um, is more morally persuasive. Not to every last person. Not that things can't get complicated, right? But like, but you know, um, I don't know. I mean, this gets really because what I'd say, oh, is gun violence in that category too? I don't know. To me, to me, it's a little bit more complicated and usually issues that are cleanly or not, um, plainly about kind of like discrimination, right? And also the fact that like, look, um, I am a person who's like very aware of like kind of cherry picking evidence. When you can have Twitter threads with like 200 or 300 examples of police attacking people brutally just during these protests, and not all black people, by the way, often white people too, right? Like that's not, those aren't, 200 isn't isolated incidents anymore. You know what I mean? Um, and at a time when kind of the world's eyes are on them, I mean, I think social media is important in kind of um, awakening people to some of this stuff. So I don't know. I think there'll be, I mean, I think there are various ways in which there could be like a um, a broader uh, cultural or political, maybe more than cultural backlash, Democrats trying to center racism in the conversation. I do think the stuff about like George Floyd and police in particular is something that might that might stick. Yeah. Claire and Perry, what's your take here? So I had three thoughts. Uh, I don't, okay, in terms of the who is going to win the election question, I tend to think it'll revert to the mean. But the one thing that did happen in this month, in this period, was you had more of the, the, the Jim Mattises, the Lisa Murkowskis, the Bushes, the Romneys. You had more of these, like Trump handled this so poorly. And what happened was so important that I think you had more of these. This was the moment. I think a lot of these people were looking for a place to say, I don't want to see a second term for Trump. And this was the place for them. And I do think that might have some marginal impact electorally, like, if you if you lose enough people in the Atlanta suburbs or the Dallas suburbs, the Houston suburbs, that is or the you know whatever suburbs, that is a problem. So that's the one place where I think Biden might, if Trump gets eighty six percent of the Republican vote instead of ninety percent, that electorally matters. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, in terms of how the Democrats campaign, it is likely we're going to have Joe Biden talk more about police police um, brutality, racial inequality, and issues like that than before. And I would argue that Kamala Harris's chances of being vice president have probably gone up, and Amy Klobuchar's chances have probably gone down. And so that itself is, a, is an uh, important effect of what's happened in the last month. And maybe I'm wrong about that, but I think that at this moment right now, it would look hard to pick Amy Klobuchar and a little easier to pick somebody who's black. Yeah. yeah. I think the one last thing, because I think Perry and Nate have both spoken very well on like what the effects of this will be but just to go to like electoral ramifications i do think this this election will be a lot about race um and about crisis and the fact that trump is perceived um broadly and specifically in this crisis as being racist is an electoral problem for him i mean you know Reagan went to pains to like appear before the NAACP so that he wouldn't seem racist to like white suburban independent voters. Trump doesn't do that kind of stuff, really. Um, he's he's not going out of his way to sort of provide white voters who might be on the line about him kind of like this cover that like, see, he's not a racist. Trump doesn't really do that. He plays into it, which I think could be bad electorally. You know, um, it makes people think like, yikes, do I really want to vote for a racist? Um, so that's my that's my last thought about like what this might do to the 2020 election. Yeah, no, that's interesting to think about, like kind of talking about racism and opposing racism isn't just about like getting the black vote for historically Republican candidates. It's also about suburban whites. I mean, I think that's a good point. Um all right, let's wrap things up by looking at the latest trends in coronavirus data. So looking at the past couple of weeks, we see that in states like Arizona, Utah, Texas, and Florida, there's been an increase in infections. And there's been some debate about whether we're seeing a second wave. And I know, Nate, that you have thoughts about this. So are we experiencing a second wave of the coronavirus pandemic? No, we're in the first wave is the short answer. Um, yeah. So look, um, a couple of things are important. Um, the places where cases are increasing tend to be places where they actually were not hit that hard 
initially, um, despite a lot of focus on um, on the South in particular from commentators. The South did not have very high overall rates of infection back in March and April relative to the Northeast and some parts of the Midwest. Um, so you're now seeing waves in the South, in the Southwest, on the West Coast, um, even in some states that are very isolated and rural that, um, that were kind of avoided it the first time around. And there are a couple of reasons why that might be the case, right? Number one is that if you don't know people in your community who are getting sick, um, then you might be less cautious. So both individuals and governments may be less cautious, right? Um, number two is there are some factors related to the fact that in New York, where an estimated 25 or something percent of the population um, already had coronavirus, according to various serology tests and various statistical estimates, that actually makes a fair amount of difference. Um, it's not enough to prevent spread on its own, according to most estimates, but like, but um, if one out of every four people that you would pass it to are at least for the time being, because we're not sure how long this lasts, immune, that can dampen spread a fair bit. So if you're at a place where kind of everyone is susceptible, then the disease can start to spread more fast, like it did in March in some places. Um, so no, it's kind of these places are experiencing a first wave. Um, they're experiencing a first wave that is still cresting or maybe was at a plateau and has now started to tip back up a little bit again. Um, you are not seeing the huge, very rapid growth you had in New York or something where cases were doubling every couple of days. It's more gradual, but like, but look, the key variable we've talked about before is called R. Some people call it R not or R effective or RT. Uh, you know, there are, it doesn't matter, right? I'm just gonna call it R. Um, if that is above one, that means cases are growing, right? Um, in New York City, R was by various estimates anywhere from like two and a half, maybe up to three and a half or four at the peak. It's growing very fast, right? In Arizona right now it might be 1.2. So it's like, it's not growing nearly as fast as it did in New York. The problem is that if 1.2 means that like you're increasing by 20% roughly every five days, if you increase by 20% every five days and you multiply that over a few weeks, right? And you don't have conditions to control the spread, then that becomes a problem after after a few weeks. Um, and so, so yeah, it's not, it's not a, it's bad news. It's not a second wave. And I think people who call it a second wave are kind of not actually looking at the data for like kind of what's actually happening in these places and where it's happening. What does this mean? I think this is like, well, this is an epidemiological question that we might not necessarily try to answer. It's also a political question. Uh, I mean, I think earlier on in this pandemic, there was a pretty clear partisan divide. Democrats were more adamant about reducing risk. Republicans were less adamant. But, you know, now you see like thousands of largely left-leaning protesters gathering in large groups. You also see liberal cities starting to open up and people out in the street in crowds without masks on, drinking. And so, like, you know, where if this was happening in like Texas and Florida and Utah and there weren't kind of these big liberal cities with crowds in them, you might see Democrats kind of arguing that this is unsafe, this is dangerous, you need to shut back down, et cetera. Like, where are the dividing lines now? Like, what are the political arguments that get made? Or does everyone just ignore this? So part of the issue from my point of view is just looking at the numbers going up in some of these places is that we sort of we, we sort of know we're not going to have shutdowns again. Like the shutdowns we had, which I think in some places probably worked to reduce the spread, I think the political consensus for that is over now. So I don't think we can have those – the kind of most dramatic action is no longer in the policy menu. And I think that's for a variety of reasons, and I think that's bipartisan on some level. So in that sense, I'm worried about the spread because of that reason alone. And also, the partisan elements are like, on some level, if Ron, just, you know, we can pick, I think, I think it's, let me use Republican governors. If we get Doug Ducey, Ron DeSantis, Brian Kemp, and Donald Trump to stand up and like wear masks all the time and do a mask are good press conference, that would be useful, even if they did not necessarily shut the businesses down again. I don't think they're going to do that either. And that's kind of where I, the worry is that I wonder what kind of public, if we're going to have, if we're having more spread, um, I wonder what our public policy options realistically are to stop it that we can all agree upon that can work that are realistic. And I'm wondering if that list of options in April and May was very short, was very high, and now is fairly low. 
Yeah, I mean, because now all the public health experts are basically warning against the thing that happens in every single American news story, which is fatigue. And so it becomes, you know, as people have put it, the normalization of 800 to 1000 deaths a day in America from this disease. I think ultimately, this becomes an economic conversation um, towards the end of the summer, beginning of the fall, which is basically like the hottest time for the general election campaign. Um, you know, you're going to see there's people predicting a huge eviction crisis. Um, we're in a recession. Um, there's, I think, you know, there's an interesting thing where the protests um, have provided this this kind of um, sheen of acceptability for liberals to go out and be in the world and kind of um, almost assuage their guilt at being... Um, being in the mainstream with like coronavirus quarantine fatigue. Um, I think everyone in the country feels that. Um, but I think the public, the public health conversation, the, that side of things, the disparities in death and what communities are hit hardest, black and Latino communities, that's kind of lost now. And to me, from a political point of view, it's almost become uh, just an economic recovery story, which I think is disturbing. I think what's one thing that's lacking is like there's a little bit of a or a lot of a lack of kind of consensus over like what even people are supposed to do. Right. Um, back in March, there was a consensus of kind of health policy experts that like um, we have to shut down for a period of time. We'll kind of figure out what comes next. Right. And like and now it's just like I don't think there's like any kind of coherent strategy from anybody um frankly um i think one of the things that kind of doesn't get expressed enough is that like um sure you can keep doing a lockdown but when you lift the lockdown then maybe you have cases go up maybe not maybe there are enough conditions in place like i wish there were kind of more people who were like aggressive mask bros right and like girls right who are like you know what we can go party with our masks on you know what i mean <laughs> but like i mean the surgeon general said this today like kind of really reinforcing the idea like actually it seems like and i don't want to get too much into data over the protests probably too easy to see a signature of the protest in the data but like but like you know but like actually if we're doing things with masks on then we can get kind of um back to more of a state of normal and so i kind of really wish that like people who are pro ending lockdowns were also very kind of vocally pro mask um, but yeah, no, I mean, look, like I mean, mask for mask. Is that what you're talking about when you say mask bros? No, they're like, yeah, man, let's go <laughs> party with masks on. It's a tolerance. It's a, it's a thing that's not, it's a risk tolerance that's based on almost like people's own personalities, not their political persuasions. Nate and I might have a different tolerance for risk from Perry or from Galen and therefore feel differently about reopening. And there's kind of this weird retrofitting of like, are you for or against such and such policy based on political party, which to me seems wholly inadequate because it's really about like personal fear, frankly, of death, <laughs> which I think like manifests itself differently in different people, regardless of how they feel politically. Yeah, I think I think it's about kind of revealed preference versus what someone might ostensibly say in in a poll, right? And I think what motivates people, like you're saying, Claire, is like people will stay home to the extent um, that they feel they're taking a personal risk that outweighs the benefit of whatever activity they want to engage in, right? Um, people will not for very long stay home as a result of altruism, meaning, oh, I can go out and I'm healthy, I won't get sick, but if I do, I can increase spread in my community. I think the phase where people stay home because of altruism is probably over, and I think that is in part because it's not a very united country right now. Um, and you can kind of, and now both um, sides, sorry to use that phrase, do have enough examples where they can kind of blame and point toward hypocrisy and say, no, it's it's your fault, right? And so, but none of that is good for people behaving altruistically. Um, and kind of when you start to make it a risk assessment, then people begin to say, okay, I'm weighing my risk, right? There's a one in X thousand chance that if I get on a plane, I'll get coronavirus, but you're not thinking about how can I spread it to other people on that plane or whatever else, people when I land. But like, I think the altruism is kind of 
is over. And that's kind of what um, makes the discourse kind of even more like raw than it was before. So uh, just one, th- so I agree a lot with what Nate said. Um, one thing to note, two per- I think Axios, Axios did a poll about this. 2% of Americans went to these protests according to Axios polling. So that means that most people who won't vote for Hillary Clinton did not go. In fact, the, the vast majority, the- like I talked to people throughout last week who said, I agree with the protests. Of course, I'm not going to a protest. I'm 65 years old. The idea I would go to a protest is insanity. So I don't think that it's total. So I think actually, I feel more heartened about what I'm the, the cases are going up, but I do see the pictures I see at the protests are a lot of people wearing masks. A lot of people are not going to the protests. The, re- the restaurants, at least in Louisville, ha- are all expanding their outdoor space, which tells me people have gotten that message that they should eat outdoors. So I do think if LeBron James, Donald Trump, conservative actor Y, country music, country music person Z all said – we should wear a mask whenever you can, eat outside whenever you can, and two other things. We're not going to close everybody's business anymore, but I do think there are four things. Fauci said it too. We can, there are probably four or five things that we should try to figure out some consensus around that are not that hard, that are not going to close everybody's business, and that maybe we should shame you about those three or four things. Do not just go willy. Like wearing a mask is not that hard. Closing your business is hard. And so I do, I do think I'm hoping for more consensus around sort of a little less controversial things. I'm looking forward to uh, LeBron James and Toby Keith's PSA. Toby Keith, them. great. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that even though it seems like the partisan positions on this have broken down a bit, now that, as you mentioned, Nate, like both sides have clear examples of people not socially distancing, whether it's protests or honestly, you know, If you saw the video of St. Mark's Place on Friday, tons of young people out in the street drinking with no masks on. Um, You know, it seems like the partisanship has broken down. But still, when you look at polls, people are answering as if this is a partisan position. So are they just like saying that because those were the indicators that they got from elites early on and are sticking with them regardless of their personal behavior or like what's going on here? I don't see. I mean, it depends on what you ask them. I do think the evidence is in the polls that I've seen still suggest people are not behaving like it's February anymore. Right. There is some polling show. I think conservatives, they're not they're not as pro mask as Democrats are. But there are plenty of conservatives who are generally open to the idea of wearing a mask, not congregating. Like, I'll be curious with this. Like, I think the in Tulsa, where Trump's going to have this rally, I assume most people who voted for I'm being a little bit silly here, but most people who voted for Trump are probably not going to be at that rally. And my guess is some of them will not be there who wanted to be there because of the coronavirus. So I'm not, I don't, so the poll, it depends on how you ask the question. I sometimes think we overdo the partisan divide on question why. Will you go to a large concert voluntarily tomorrow is I think not that divisive an issue. So I think most people are still saying no, and that's across party lines as far as I can tell. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think there is still some agreement here. Yeah, no, look, and, and, um, you know, one of the problems with kind of sharing these photos of people partying on St. Mark's Place apart from um, apart from uh, whether shaming is an effective strategy, I think probably not, right, is like it ne- isn't necessarily representative, right? Um, a lot of people are staying home or being careful. You have little pockets of things that are occurring. I mean, even like, um, even like a 15,000-person protest, um, in Brooklyn, right? I was kind of going through my head this morning and trying to make assumptions about like how many new cases would that cause given various assumptions. Um, and I, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I'm not going to give you my speculation. It's not all that many, though, relative to a country of um, 330 million people or a city of, of 8.3 million people in New York City. Um, and so, you know, um, it's a kind of everyday behavior that people engage in that probably is a lot more important than highly visible things, some casino in Las Vegas or some protest or some party in the Ozarks or in Manhattan or whatever else. And like, um, and I don't know. I mean, it definitely seems like people are fatigued and kind of letting their, their guard down um, a fair bit. At the same time, I do want to like, um, and with kind of a note of very, very, very guarded <laughs> optimism, right? Which is like, the goalposts are shifting a little bit. Um, where was it on May 
first early May, the New York Times kind of published a story saying we are worried that like by um, by end of May, 200,000 people a day will be diagnosed with coronavirus and 3,000 people a day will die. Um, those were not consensus predictions. They were kind of this obviously, or not obviously, but somewhat dubiously claimed White House projections. It's not clear if anyone actually uh, believed in these in the White House. Um, but now we're talking about like, um, you know, over the past week, around 700 people have died per day, not 3,000. Um, and we're debating whether cases are going up or down, but they're not like, we're not at 200,000 cases. We might be at 23,000 a day. And so there has been some goalpost shifting. Um, you know, I do think in terms of, in addition to shaming not working, I think like for some reason, like um, anytime you say, oh, actually kind of this city's doing something smart and the state has contact tracing now, right? And hey, cases have been going down in this state for, for two weeks, five weeks in a row, right? There's no kind of, celebration of these kind of small successes. And so it kind of, I don't know. It, you, I mean, there's been some other research that says like when people are fatalistic about coronavirus, cause they feel like it's not going to get fixed, then they actually do less distancing. You know what I mean? They're like, well, screw it. I'm not going to distance for 18 months. Right. And also this like disconnect because you hear all these things about spikes, but maybe then because these spikes are coming in areas where um, the absolute rates aren't that high, just that they're increasing. They don't kind of know people who have it. And then I don't know. Right. It just kind you of, you don't want to um, encourage people to have like end of the world parties. Right. Um, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> so I think this has been definitely an interesting conversation. And, and as with, as, as per usual, we'll just see what ends up happening as these behaviors continue and as we continue tracking the coronavirus data. But I think that's it for now, unless anybody has anything else they want to end on. I'd invite all of you to my end of the world party. <laughs> <laughs> what would you serve? What no, drink at least... would you serve? This is funny. When I was in college, my my first semester senior year, I was my paper's drinking columnist. And this mm. was when they had the... Yeah, the Claire! <laughs> Do you remember the Large Hadron Particle Collider in in uh, Switzerland? This was this. I was obsessed with this story that they were going to flick the switch, and there was like an extremely slim possibility that the that a black hole would form and that the world would end. And that was like the theme of my drinking column the week the thing came out. Is I went to all these different bars and asked bartenders, "Make me the drink that you're going to serve." right before the world ends so but we, we wouldn't know it we would just die in an instant well we know they were flipping the switch <laughs> like what do you think the guy the guy who flipped the switch i mean i probably have like a daiquiri or something a daiquiri okay yeah. perry what's your end of the world drink <laughs> uh I, I like old fashioned so i'll just have that as the end of the world drink because i can't think of anything else honestly neat Something much stronger than alcohol, I think. Uh, so that's a good answer. Right. <laughs> that was a good yeah, answer. I was going to say, if you really force me, just like mm, half a bottle of Everclear, like, I don't know, like the world's ending. I think what's clear is like, it has to be hard liquor, not like wine or like an IPA, right? Like that can't be your last drink. There are definitely people in this world who would have an IPA as their last drink. I'll just have a soft on the palate Chardonnay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, all right. Well, let's leave it there. Thank you, Nate. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, Galen. And thank you, Perry. Thanks, Galen. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.